In Numbers chapter 15 and verse 39, the word says, Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. Huh. This ribbon of blue was a test of the Israelites' obedience. Here, simple obedience came in the color of blue. Blue, I like that. Well, hello and welcome to From Sickness to Health. I am your host, Rico Hill, and this is the Blue Guy. That's me, also known as Sickness. Hey, Rico, I noticed on that last scripture you were a little preoccupied with color, so I'd like to do a little test. Fine, go ahead. Okay, here we go. What color is this? It's brown. Is it red? Clearly, it's brown. Oh, interesting. What color is this? Oh, come on. It's red. It's red. Exactly, Rico. I know that you're going to talk about red meat today, and I just wanted to get our colors straight right okay, from the beginning. Okay, I see where this is going. In this program, we're going to share with you clear-cut research that shows the significant warnings about the dangers of eating red meat. How is it red meat? Hamburgers, brown. Steaks, brown. Lamb chops, brown. Spaghetti and meatballs, mostly brown, little red sauce. I think you get my point. How is it red meat? Look, I'm not gonna answer the question anymore. Let's roll it. Don't ignore me. Is it because I'm a person of color? <laughs> roll it. Well, hello and welcome to From Sickness to Health. Thank you for joining us here in the studio. We have a topic today that you are going to love, maybe to hate. Today joining us here in the studio is a friend of mine. It is Dr. Milton Mills. He is a critical care physician at the United Medical Center in Washington, D.C. But that's not all. He's also the Associate Director of Preventative Medicine for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Now, there are two words that I love in his title, and that's preventative and that's responsible. Thank you so much, doctor, for being here with us on the program. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm Praise thrilled. the Lord. Now, we're going to be talking about red meat, as we've just seen from sickness, and some people, uh, they don't call it red meat. Some people think it's brown meat. Some people just don't care what color it is. They just are emotional about it. But before we get into it, let's give our, our co-host, the Blue Guy Sickness, an opportunity to share what he thinks on the subject. So let's take a look. Thank you, Rico. What I've got here is a nice, juicy steak. And everyone loves a good steak. This guy here, he's a 22 ounce of goodness. What I like is all the fat around it and the fact that it's rare. You know, rare meat takes a lot longer to digest. Look at all that blood, that ooey goodness. You know, the average piece of red meat takes eight to 10 days to go through your system. And if you're lucky, two weeks. Mm. Think of all that rotting goodness putrefying in your stomach. Along the way, you may get some colon cancer. There's that risk, but taste always outweighs the risk. Back to you, Rico. Mm -hmm. This is gonna be good. <laughs> Well, I don't know about that. We have lots to say about that, don't we? Sure. Okay, but before we jump into it, you know, there are traditions that us, uh, are, are associated with our diet and what we eat. I mean, we have all types of holidays that, and, and family traditions that play a part. In, in fact, there's the story that goes, a uh, young girl asking her mother, you know, as she was baking a ham and she was looking for this particular pot and she couldn't find it. And she was all up in arms, she was upset. And the daughter said, why don't you just use a different pot? 
And the mother said, no, we have to use this pot because it's the one that makes it taste better. She said, well, why does it make it taste better? And the mother couldn't quite answer. She said, go ask your grandmother. So she goes to ask the grandmother, and the grandmother said, because it makes it taste better. But she says, why? And she couldn't answer. She, and there was another uh, great-grandmother, the three lines of this, in this generation. And they asked her great-grandmother, why, why does it make the ham taste better? And the great-grandmother, not wanting to pull any punches, not willing to make up anything, she just said, baby, that's all we had. So we see that sometimes tradition is the only reason why we do certain things. People eat certain ways, doctor, from tradition, from opinion, and sometimes from emotions. Can you talk about that for us? Sure. You know, it's, I, I've, I once read that all animals feed, only human beings eat. Mm -hmm. And what that is designed to get at is the fact that we humans have an emotional response to the food that we eat. For instance, if I invited you over my house for a meal, yeah. and when you came to my house, you would obviously get dressed and come expecting you know, a nice meal, and when you walked into the house, I uh, went to the kitchen sink, rummaged around, got a pot of uh, uh, some oatmeal from this morning's uh, breakfast, scraped some out, and uh, threw it on the floor and said, bon appetit, you would be absolutely <laughs> insulted. My dog would be thrilled. <laughs> that exactly. en en encapsulates very well the difference we have in terms of how we emotionally respond yeah. to the way food is presented to us. Okay. We expect that it's going to have certain, you know, uh, a certain presentation, certain qualities, certain uh, emotional aspects. And that's one of the reasons that we have such a hard time making dietary change because there are cultural and emotional components to uh, what and how we eat. Many of the foods that people feel attached to, they feel attached to because this is, you know, the way we've always done it. This is what my grandmother or my mom or, you know, what yeah. we've traditionally eaten for, you know, the holidays or for this particular season. But it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the intrinsic nutritional value of the food. And in fact, many of the things that we've been taught to eat, we now know are not good for us and have uh, very deleterious effects on our health and we need to make change. So we need to try and divorce ourselves from the uh, emotional attachment we have to some of the things we eat and start to look at them more critically. What we have to understand is that food is really just a collection of chemicals that are designed to do two things. One, deliver energy to our bodies, and two, provide our bodies with the nutrients it needs to, or, the, or, or they need, to function healthfully. So anytime we sit down to a meal, we need to ask ourselves, what nutrients is this plate of food going to be delivering to me? And this, the corollary to that question is, is it going to be doing anything to my body that is actually going to harm me? And the, 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 uh, um, if the answers to that question are, one, it's not delivering any nutrients to me, and two, it is, and that in fact it is harming my body, then we shouldn't be eating it. So we need to, we need to help people to be a lot wiser about their choices and, and, and their concept of food. And we want to try to accomplish that in this, in this program. So today, before we, we, we go further with our discussion, because we have a lot to cover, sure. and I know it's going to be really good as we start to, start to jump in some of the research that you've done, uh, we want to actually see what the news is saying. It, can we get some insights? On this show, we like to get uh, a sense of what, not only what you and I are going to say, we want to see what the news is telling people. Sure. We want to see what the people in the street are saying. But ultimately, we're going to come back right after we see this clip, and we're going to see what the Bible says. Absolutely. Let's do that. Let's take a look. 
The Harvard School of Public Health saying there is a dramatically increased risk of death from eating as little as one extra serving of red meat per day. So let's bring in our medical editor, Dr. Richard Besser, to talk about this. So what's the headline here with the study? Well, you know, Robin, we've known that there's a, a connection between eating red meat and heart disease, eating red meat and certain types of cancer. Here they looked at eating red meat and your risk of having an early death. And what they found was pretty stunning. For every additional serving of red meat you have per day, your risk of dying early during the course of this study goes up by 12 percent. I mean, that's huge, 12 percent. But there is some good news here because they're also saying small changes could have a big impact. That's right. You know, whenever I see a study like this, it's like, well, well, what do you do about it? But they look to see what happens when you substitute one of those portions of red meat for a healthier protein. And what they found was it, for every time you do that substitution with something like fish, poultry, nuts, uh, grains, your risk of that early death goes down by 19%. So there is something you can so do. So they're not only saying stay away from a lot of red meat, but they're saying if you do take these substitutions that you're gonna it matters it matters yeah whoa whoa this is some serious scientific research that is and most people don't know about it that's true that's it's, a, it's true. amazing to me that you can have all of the media uh, most of the the news outlets they're they're talking about this but when you get into a group of people it's as if they have heard nothing about it but I, here's what I like to do I like to go and and see if the news is agreeing to what God has said so I'm gonna go into the Bible and I'm gonna look and see at the diet that God has given and I'm gonna look at three verses uh, in three different um, chapters of the book of Genesis. So first I'm going to take a look at Genesis 129. I'm going to do this very quickly. And before I look at, into the scripture, I always like to pray so God will guide our thoughts and guide those who are hearing. So let's just pray very quickly. Father in heaven, we thank you for the word and we pray that you would bless it and bless those who are hearing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Genesis 129 it says, and God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Then in Genesis chapter 3, after the fall, he changes the diet. He adds something to it. And that's found in Genesis chapter 3 in verse 18. It says, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. So God has now brought into fruits, nuts, grains, and seeds, he's brought in the herb of the field. Can I interject something? Sure. Right the reason God enlarged the diet for humans was because he had changed their diet by barring their access to the tree, fruit uh, from the tree of life. Because now they could no longer eat from the tree of life. Absolutely. And we know from uh, uh, earlier in Genesis, he said the reason he wasn't going to allow them to continue to eat from the fruit of the tree of life was because the fruit of the tree of life, uh, from the tree of life, had the power to perpetuate life indefinitely. And by that we can infer that that fruit had the power to help rebuild and restore the tissues of the body. Yes. And since they no longer had access to that fruit, he had to enlarge their diet to other types of plant foods that could partially replace the nutrients they were no longer getting from that special fruit. And those were the uh, plant foods described as the herbs of the field, which are your legumes, your grains, and your vegetables. And in the, the, the green of that vegetable, we find chlorophyll. Absolutely. Which is absolutely essential. It's, some people call it green blood. Right. So right. this was needed, and God knew that they needed this now. Now, the third part of the diet, because it changes after the flood, doesn't it? Yes. Changes after the flood, and now I'm going to Genesis chapter 9. In Genesis chapter 9, and again, so that you're, you're paying attention at home and keeping track, we're looking to see if what we've just seen in the news clip is agreeing with what the Bible says, what God has said. So in Genesis chapter 9, in verses 3, 4, and 5, it says, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Verse 4, But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And verse 5, And surely your blood 
of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it and at the hand of man at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man so the word of God is saying that I gave you fruits nuts grains and seeds but because of sin I added to it as you just uh, clearly articulated but then once the flood came and there was no more vegetation God says, I'm going to allow you to eat meat, but when you eat it, your life is going to be shortened. Right. The I, clip has just agreed with the Word of God. Go ahead. Absolutely. John. I would also argue that that was meant to be temporary. And I think, again, we can infer that that was meant to be a temporary uh, uh, enlargement of the diet because Numbers 11, when God brought his people out of Egypt, he fed them with manna which uh, Psalms describes as being the corn of heaven and angel's food. And Amen. God wanted them to eat this plant-based diet, but it was the Israelites who demanded flesh, which again, Numbers 11 tells us, angered God and, caught, and he sent a flock of quails into the camp so they could have the meat they demanded, but many of them died with the flesh between their teeth and it came out of their nostrils. So again, it was God's desire that we continue to eat the plant-based diet that he had designed us to eat originally, but it was the humans who demanded the flesh, and he relented and allowed them to eat only certain uh, types of flesh. Wow, that is amazing when you think about that. So we, it, it brings into question that God has a perfect will, and then he has a permissive will. So his Absolutely. perfect will and desire was that man, first of all, would live forever, which is what you were describing earlier when you were talking about the tree of life. Man was designed to live forever, but his permissive will brought in a different diet just to help man to live Correct. a little longer. But then after the flood, then man had to eat the flesh, which was temporary, as the doctor has just pointed out, and that was designed to just help him to get along again. Permissive will. Right. And you mentioned this, that he, he, they, desired to have, uh, 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 they desired to have meat, and he gave it to them, but it made them sick. Absolutely. It made them sick. Again, we're seeing that. Right. But in Psalm 105, it says that, that when the tribes of Israel were journeying through the wilderness, there was not one feeble member among them. So the ones who wanted to eat it, they died off. But Absolutely. the ones who continued to eat the manna in the way that God said, there was none that were sick. Absolutely. Furthermore, we're told in the first chapter of Daniel, when uh, Daniel was carried captive into Babylon, he was uh, given this very, he and his uh, Hebrew companions were given a very rich uh, diet uh, from uh, their Babylonian captors that um, included meat, wine, and a bunch of other things that Daniel decided he did not want to defile himself with. So he went to his overseer and he said, look, we don't want to eat this. We want to eat just vegetables and water. His uh, uh, overseer said, look, if I, if I let you guys eat this way, you're going to get sick, you're going to, uh, uh, and I'm going to basically be uh, uh, executed for not um, uh, letting you eat a healthier diet. He said, test us, let us eat nothing but vegetable and water for 10 days, then compare us to the people eating the uh, king's diet uh, after 10 days and see who is healthier. And after 10 days, the Bible tells us that Daniel and his companions were fairer, healthier, uh, and looked much better than those who ate the regular diet, and therefore they were allowed to continue to eat their plant-based diet indefinitely. So again, the Bible makes it very clear that not only were we originally designed to eat a plant-based diet, but that when we do adhere to that diet, we are healthier, we look better, and we live longer. Praise God. Now, we want to we want to take a look here because people on the streets don't know this. And um, our co-host sickness went out and he talked to people and he just wanted to see what they have to say on the subject. Let's take a look and see what sure. they're saying. Hey, everybody. I'm here with my friend Max. What part of the country are you from, Max? Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, man, this guy knows how to pick his cities. Let me ask you a question. They know how to eat down south, right? Uh -huh. What's some of your favorite food? 
Hot wings. Hot wings! Hallelujah! What else do you like? Uh, ribs, tacos. Ribs, tacos. What else? Keep going. You're making my day. Hamburgers, tacos. Hamburgers! Tacos, you said? Yeah. Hamburgers, you said? Yeah. Oh, you like steak? Yeah. Okay, let me ask you one more question. Red meat. Do you like red meat? I do. I love red meat. What types of red meat do you like? I like steaks. Oh, steaks, the big ones, right? Yes, the really good ones. Hamburgers? Mm, they have to be like super sized. And juicy. And juicy. Oh, we're our best friends. Yes. She's a carnivore connoisseur. I know. What do you think about a nice juicy steak? I love steak, but that's it's heavy. It's, it's real heavy. heavy food, man. It's heavy. It takes it's like... me like about a week to get out of my system. Now, would you consider yourself someone who likes red meat? Yeah, I like steak. Red meat. Yeah, hamburger. Had some bacon this morning. Oh, she had some bacon this morning. She's a carnivore connoisseur. Yes. Carnivore connoisseur. That's what yes, you are. That's right. I love you more every single day. <laughs> this is fantastic. We love this lady. You need to come on down south and cook for us. Oh, I can. I know of some vegetarians that you could cook for. Mm, mm -hmm. We don't like vegetarians. We do not like vegetarians. Let's say it in the camera together. We, we do, do not, not like, like vegetarians. vegetarians. Back to you. Well, there you have it. We see that people are, you know, they love their steaks. They love their, you know, <laughs> they love their red meat, man. And, and the thing is, is that they're, they're loving it out of an emotional place. They're loving it out of the tradition. And do, now, here's, I'm going to let you just kind of go sure. and just share this okay. research because it's, it's fascinating. Do they love the taste as they think? Do they love the smell? Right. Break that whole thing down. Well, first of all, I, I, you saw me laughing, Rico, and I'm laughing because they think they love it. They really don't. Because I, I tell people, if you really loved meat, you would eat it the way real carnivores eat it. That's raw, bloody, and rotting, and covered with flies and maggots. Oh, man. When is the last time you saw a dog or a cat say, I'm not going to touch a piece of meat unless it's been fried, uh, breaded, and covered with, you know, some sort of peppercorn sauce and, you know, lightly sauteed in garlic and oil. <laughs> I mean, they don't care about that. They will eat it in its native state, which is something we find utterly disgusting. And tell us why. Uh, it is because we are not designed to eat it. We, 90% uh, of the people who choke to death every year, according to the uh, ear, nose, and throat literature, choke to death on animal flesh. Why? Because our esophagus, the tube that leads from our mouth to our stomach, is not designed to handle animal tissue. Carnivores have no problem with it. They uh, tear off a hunk of flesh, swallow it whole. Why? Because carnivores don't chew their food. They don't have to. Uh, herbivores have to chew their food because plant foods have a lot of fiber in them, and in order to digest them effectively, you have to uh, uh, disrupt that, uh, those fibrous tissues so that you can mix the plant foods with digestive enzymes that are contained in the saliva so that the process of digest can, digestion can actually begin yeah. with the chewing. Carnivores don't have uh, enzymes in their saliva. Herbivores do. Humans are herbivores. We have an enzyme called salivary amylase in our saliva that begins the process of breaking down carbohydrates as we chew our food. And our esophagus is designed as all herb, uh, um, herbivores esophaguses are designed to handle thoroughly chewed, small, soft balls of food, which then go to the stomach and, and uh, allow the process of digestion to, to continue. Carnivores also have huge stomachs. A um, 50 kilogram wolf can eat 30% of its body weight at one meal. 30%? 30%. Of its body weight? Of its body weight. That's 15 kilograms of meat at one meal. Whoa, that's over 30 pounds of meat in one meal. That's absolutely true. And another thing, Although they have binocular vision, their eyes are very different from ours. They have permanent night vision goggles. They see <laughs> over six times better at night than we do. Why? Because their prey is usually asleep at night, so they hunt at night. And furthermore, we have an area of uh, 
acute vision in our eyes called a phobia. They don't have a phobia. What they have is what's called a linear streak that allows them to follow movement very well, which is why anything that's moving along that linear streak in the back of their eye, they will chase. But they don't see detail very well because they don't need to. All they need to be able to do is track movement because anything that's moving is probably something that they can eat. Whereas for Whoa. us, we need color vision, which they don't have. Why? Because we need to be able to tell which uh, plant foods are ripe and ready to be eaten. And we also need to be able to see fine detail so that we can pick uh, grains and roots and tubers uh, so that we will be able to gather the, the uh, fruits, vegetables, and other things that we need to eat and provide ourselves with the energy that we need. But just one more point about the, uh, the, the differences in the stomachs. Carnivores typically are very inefficient hunters. They will, 95% of the time they go out to hunt, they don't uh, make a kill. So they eat on average in the wild every, once every seven to 10 days. So they have to be able to eat enough at one meal to last them 10 days. That's why they have these gigantic stomachs. Plant eaters have to eat multiple times every single day. And that's why they're designed to walk around and eat multiple times a day, but they have much smaller stomachs. Wow. Classic that, plant eater. I am blown away. So what you have just said to the audience is that animals are predators and they are looking for something that's running. We don't chase after food. No, we don't. We need color because oh, our eyes respond to color because we need to know when it's right. Absolutely. Praise God. I tell you, this has been an exciting discussion. We're going to have to pick it up in another program. Hopefully we can get some more of these facts in. You have been hearing about the dangers of eating red meat and how you can have a healthy alternative, how you can do something that is actually health to the body. So just keep in mind what we have shared today. These are facts. Check them out for yourself, though. And we look forward to seeing you in another broadcast of From Sickness to Health. May God bless you. Thank you, Doc. We appreciate it. My pleasure. You know, who can deny that a juicy hamburger is delicious? I can't. When I ate meat, there was nothing better for me than a hamburger and some french fries. I didn't think there was anything other than that. But I tell you, when I was eating it, I always felt drained. My energy was just zapped. But we've learned today in this program that eating red meat can do more than zap your energy. It can actually cause you to have sicknesses and different types of diseases that you otherwise wouldn't have. It is proven that a whole food, plant-based diet is best for our health. Yes, it's best for our health. It helps you live longer. All the stats, I've heard them, and you can live a long, miserable life. Look, I'm just saying that if people want to enjoy their food and have the risk of cancer, let their taste buds win that war. And hey, so what if they get their mind and body clogged up so they can't hear the voice of reason? What about hearing the voice of God? What's that have to do with it? Here's the thing. If you have a clogged system, then you'll have a clogged mind. And when you have a clogged mind, how can you hear the voice of God? Make no mistake, this is a battle for the mind. The Bible tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle with principalities and darkness in high places. We must understand that this is not just about eat this or eat that or don't eat this and don't eat that. No, it is a battle for our minds. Are you going to be able to hear the voice of God? Well, that's our program for today. As always, I leave you with this. Third John 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. I'm Rico Hill. And I'm the blue guy, sickness.